Back in 1995, the Watchtower helped us to understand that the final judgment of the sheep and the goats will be decided when Jesus comes in his glory during the Great Tribulation. Does this mean that the judgment process does not start until then? The answer is no. Why can we say this? Well, let's illustrate the point. Think about judgments delivered by a Supreme Court. When the day arrives for a judgment to be announced, does this mean that only then the, the court starts to consider the evidence at hand? No. By that time, the court has already read briefs, they have prepared and heard oral arguments, and then they consider the legal background to the case. This may take considerable time. No court opinion is considered final until it is delivered in open court or released to the public. What is the point? Well, if the Supreme Courts of human governments take time to hear all the facts and to weigh all the circumstances, should we be surprised that Jesus is wisely using his time now to judge people fairly? By the start of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will know who is goat-like and who is sheep-like. I imagine what we've just heard is incredibly tedious and boring for those of you who have never been Jehovah's Witnesses and for whom this is all very convoluted and silly. But what Kenneth Cook has just said is actually a big deal in the Jehovah's Witness world. Because what you find at these annual meetings is that the governing body will use these events as an opportunity to release new things. This new thing could be a new publication. It could be a new method of preaching. It could be a new video. It could be a new building. But it could also be a new interpretation or an adjusted interpretation of some prophecy in the Bible. We had this in the 2019 annual meeting when they changed their minds about who the locusts are who are mentioned in the Bible book of Joel. It had previously been the understanding that these were the same locusts that are mentioned in Revelation. But at the 2019 annual meeting, David Splain divulged that for the first time, the governing body had been able to read the verse in Joel in context and had therefore come up with the conclusion that no, these were different locusts to the Revelation locusts. Kenneth Cook is now doing essentially the same exercise with a different prophecy He's saying, oh, well, we had a mistaken understanding as recently as 1995. We've since then changed our minds. There has been new light. God has helped us to reach an adjusted understanding on when it is that Jesus judges who is sheep-like and who is goat-like. In other words, who survives Armageddon? and who doesn't. But let's just do a very quick whistle-stop tour through the history of the sheep and goats teaching. In 1923, Rutherford divulged that the sheep and goats will be judged in the Lord's day, in other words, in the present, or the present in 1923 or around 1923. In other words, it's something that was supposed to be happening at that time or now. If you look up the 1979 Watchtower, October 1st, pages 26 and 27, it says, Again in Los Angeles in 1923, a convention was held and the society's president talked on Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats by scripture he established the fact that the symbolic sheep of this parable are those who now, during this time of the end, do good in various ways to Jesus' spiritual or born-again brothers. In reward for this, doers of good would be preserved through the coming battle of Armageddon 
and the glorified Son of Man, the heavenly King Jesus Christ, would usher them into the earthly realm of his kingdom of a thousand years. Ironically, that's what the teaching is now. <laughs> so what we have unveiled at this 2020 annual meeting by Kenneth Cook is essentially a flip-flop. New Light has brought Jehovah's Witnesses back to Old Light, a previous understanding that they have since deviated from. What I've just read describes what the current teaching is again. But in 1995, they changed it. They decided that the sheep and the goats will be judged after the Great Tribulation. In other words, in the future. We can see this very plainly if we go to the 1995 Watchtower, October 15th, page 23. Understanding the parable of the sheep and the goats in this way indicates that the rendering of judgment on the sheep and the goats is future. It will take place after the tribulation mentioned at Matthew 24 verses 29 and 30 breaks out and the Son of Man arrives in his glory. Then with the entire wicked system at its end, Jesus will hold court and render and execute judgment. But the teaching changed again. In 2013, it was decided that the sheep and the goats would be judged during the great tribulation again in the future. Here's a quote from the 2013 Watchtower, July 15th, pages 6 and 7. Jesus will judge people of all nations as sheep or goats when he comes during the great tribulation future. Then at Armageddon, the climax of the great tribulation, the goat-like ones will be cut off forever. So they've gone from saying under Rutherford, the judging's taking place now, to saying in 1995, the judging will take place after the Great Tribulation, to saying in 2013, the judging will take place during the Great Tribulation, to saying in 2020, the judging's gonna take place or is taking place now. So Kenneth Cook, just said. Well, if the Supreme Courts of human governments take time to hear all the facts and to weigh all the circumstances, should we be surprised that Jesus is wisely using his time now to judge people fairly? By the start of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will know who is goat-like and who is sheep-like. God's Holy Spirit has apparently led his people all the way around the houses <laughs> So there's a teaching that was initially spelled out by Joseph Rutherford in 1923, has changed and then changed again, and then gone right back to where we started. Which, if you think about it, is exactly the sort of thing you would expect if there is no Holy Spirit involved, there is no supernatural supervision of what these beliefs and teachings are, the whole thing is just man-made, made-up nonsense. At Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus stated that a person's words would also be a basis for how he or she is judged. Let's uh, look at what Jesus said at Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Jesus said, I tell you that men will render an account on Judgment Day for every unprofitable saying that they speak. For by your words you will be declared righteous, and by your words you will be condemned. So then, does Jesus hear what we say? Yes, he does, including what we have said in preaching the good news. Now, by using the words render an account here, Jesus was referring to what a person has said in the past. That thought is reinforced by the use of the past tense in Matthew chapters 25, uh, 30, in 
Matthew chapter 25, 34 through 40 for the sheep and 41 through 45 for the goats. For example, in verse 40, Jesus says to the sheep-like ones, to the extent that you did it, past tense, to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What does this tell us? It tells us that everyone who desires to be viewed as a righteous sheep must build up a good record of support for Christ's brothers now. A person must be sheep-like when entering the Great Tribulation, and they must remain sheep-like to the very end. By the time the Son of Man comes in His glory, it will be far too late to build up such a good record with Him. This was quite an interesting cup and ball trick that Kenneth Cook has just pulled here. I hope you were following it. We start off with a verse about Jesus judging people, judging the sheep-like ones and the goat-like ones, that's actually quite condemnatory of Jehovah's Witnesses historically of the organization. But Kenneth Cook smuggles in this second verse linking it purely due to the use of the past tense, which talks about the way Christ's brothers are treated. And then he wraps the whole thing up by saying, so clearly, if we want to be judged favorably as sheep-like ones, we need to be treating Christ's brothers well, which isn't what the original verse that he was quoting said. Very interesting. What did the original verse say that he quoted from? It was Jesus saying, I tell you that men will render an account on judgment day for every unprofitable saying that they speak. For by your words you will be declared righteous, and by your words you will be condemned. What words have been spoken by the Jehovah's Witness organization? during the course of the last days. What words were spoken about the year 1925? What words were spoken about the year 1975? What words were spoken about the generation that witnessed the events of 1914 not dying off before Armageddon came? Were those words accurate? Were they truthful? Were they profitable? If you think about it, what Jesus is saying, I mean, if you take the whole thing seriously, of course, and if you genuinely consider these words to be relevant and spoken by Jesus, these are condemnatory of the faithful slave, of the governing body, of the Watchtower organization, the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses. They have been getting it wrong for decades. Their track record is one of 100% failure when it comes to predicting the end. Their back catalogue of publications reveals that they just keep getting it wrong again and again and again. How is that profitable? How does that help people? How does it help people when you lead them along with false expectations about a certain year or a certain period of time or a certain generation of people? How does it profit people? How does it help people? when you falsely build up their expectations only for those expectations to be dashed because the passage of time has proven your predictions to be false. How is any of that profitable, Kenneth Cook? But he's very cleverly dodged that by using this, again, cup and ball trick and saying, oh, never mind that, here's another verse and this is the one that I want you to think about. And what this verse means, of course, is that to be sheep-like, to be judged favorably by Jesus, what you need to do is follow Christ's brothers. In other words, do exactly as we tell you. Jesus is like the king mentioned in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 8. There it says, when the king sits on the throne to judge, he sifts out all evil with his eyes. 
In line with this, we can be certain that Jesus, our heavenly king, is already sifting and taking note of who are goat-like in their attitudes, actions, and speech. For those who continue refusing to serve Jehovah and his kingdom, their judgment will be in place as the great tribulation begins. We can say this because there are no scriptural indications of any conversions to pure worship during the great tribulation. Instead, we read at Revelation 6, 16 and 17, that those who chose not to obey the good news will at that time turn to man-made things to try to save them. They will run to things that they view as mountain-like or strong, such as their political and commercial systems. Revelation 6.16 tells us that they will cry out to such things, saying, Fall over us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. But these human institutions will have no power to save them. What will this mean for such ones? Many goat-like ones will perish early in the Great Tribulation when the governments of this world turn on and destroy false religion. Many more will perish at the hands of other goat-like people. Ezekiel 38.21 prophetically states that every man's sword will be against his own brother. Kenneth Cook is here doing two things. He is first of all resorting to the typical fear-mongering doomsday rhetoric that is just normal for Jehovah's Witness propaganda. And he's also giving a very interesting insight into the way Jehovah's Witnesses look upon human institutions, which actually tells us a lot or informs us greatly about the way the organization is approaching child sex abuse. Let's take that first element, the fear-mongering. What he's saying is that once the Great Tribulation begins, and it's supposed to begin imminently at any moment, it could begin tomorrow, as far as Jehovah's Witnesses are concerned. But he's saying once it begins, there won't be any turning back if you're a goat-like one. You can't begin the Great Tribulation as a goat-like one and revert to being or change to being a sheep-like one, you are locked in when the Great Tribulation begins. The judgment has been made. It's only a matter of time until you meet your demise. You can try running if you like, but there will be nowhere to hide. And actually, don't be surprised if you end up meeting your demise at the hand of another goat-like one because he brings in that verse in Ezekiel 38, 21, every man's sword will be against his own brother. So it's not just a case of non-Jehovah's Witnesses dying through fireballs, through the ground opening up at Armageddon. They could die during the Great Tribulation just through being killed by other goat-like ones. Basically, the Great Tribulation is essentially the beginning of Armageddon, at least in terms of the judgment having been reached and the wicked beginning to be destroyed, the goat-like ones beginning to meet their end. And obviously, as a Jehovah's Witness, you're hearing this and you're thinking, I'd better pull my socks up. If I want to survive Armageddon, it won't be enough to wait for the Great Tribulation to begin and then start doing good and then start doing what's expected of me as a Jehovah's Witness. I need to be doing good now. I need to be sheep-like now so that when that judgment is final at the start of the Great Tribulation, I get to be in the Survivors Club and then you have this point about human institutions. You have Kenneth Cook saying that goat-like ones will turn to man-made things to try to save them. They will run to things that they view as mountain-like or strong, such as their political and commercial systems. And he later says, 
but these human institutions will have no power to save them. In the context of the organization's approach to child sex abuse, this is actually very telling. Because what can we really expect of an organization that holds human institutions in such contempt? An organization that says everything that's man-made, the political system, the commercial system, we can include the judicial system, anything that's a human institution, it's going to be annihilated at Armageddon. So if that's how God views human institutions, ultimately, what should be our view of human institutions, especially when they're trying to impose their requirements on us? It makes a lot more sense when you think about the way the organization is dealing with abuse in Australia, where they've been given this generous deadline for joining that country's redress scheme. And the redress scheme, by the way, is just a means by which if you're a survivor of abuse, you don't have to go through the trauma of litigating against the organization in order to get some redress, in order to get some money, some compensation through that can help ease your ordeal that can help you get, for example, the psychological care and mental health care that you might need. The redress scheme makes it possible for people to just get that stuff by applying for it and then receiving it, not re-traumatizing them by making them go through litigation. Jehovah's Witnesses are one of only three institutions in the country who've just failed. They've just folded their arms and said, uh-uh, not joining it. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses went as far as to write a letter to the Australian government saying, this doesn't apply to us. We've got all this covered, thank you. We have our own way of dealing with child sex abuse and none of the provisions that the redress scheme is designed to accommodate are applicable to us, we've just arbitrarily decided. So no thank you, we won't get involved. In the context of what Kenneth Cook's just been saying about human institutions, it kind of makes sense, that sort of arrogance, that sort of condescending, patronizing approach to a perfectly reasonable measure that's been introduced by the government, let's make sure victims and survivors get redress. Let's make sure they don't have to jump through hoops to get a bit of help, to help them deal with what's happened to them. Jehovah's Witnesses view the whole system as doomed anyway. They view Satan's system of things as on its last legs. They have an inbuilt lack of respect for Satan's system, for the legal, judicial system of things. So is it any wonder when you reflect on Kenneth Cook's doomsday fear-mongering narrative that they are failing victims of abuse so spectacularly? Mm -hmm.